with that, we are uh, ready to move on to our, our panel, which is also the last uh, discussion for, for today. Um, I'll just quickly introduce all of our uh, panelists. Uh, this is going to be a discussion around everything that's happened today. We're just going to talk about all the new themes and, and all the new products. Uh, and for this panel, I'd like to invite uh, Vitalik Buterin, Mihailo, Paul, Bobin, uh, Brandon, and Jordi, uh, and a lot of you are already here. And then this, this whole panel will be moderated by Anna Rose from the Zero Knowledge Podcast. So um, without further ado, let's uh, welcome Anna and team uh, to uh, join us on this panel. And I'll let Anna take it from here. Hello, hello. Hi. Ask everybody to turn on video and uh, here we go. Hello everyone again. Hi. So is everyone up? Let's just give them a second to put their videos on. Mihailo, Vitalik. And I think... Paul's here too. Paul, hi. And I think we're just waiting for Brandon. Brandon, let's see if he can make it as well. We'll just give it one more minute. Ah, there we go. Do we have everyone? I think we're here. Okay, very cool. So I guess we should kick off. Um, I feel like you've already all been introduced and actually, a little bit, I wanna share a little bit what the plan is for this panel. So we have a pretty big panel um, and we have myself and Vitalik who just joined. So you have heard from a lot of the other panelists before you've heard kind of deep dives into what they're working on. But the way I wanna structure this is I kinda of wanna start with talking a little bit about a recent blog post that Vitalik uh, wrote called Endgame. Then I wanna bring in all the other speakers to talk about the different ZK solutions they're building to potentially compare and contrast them or see how they're collaborating. I wanna talk a bit about ZK community, the tools that are missing. And if we have time, I wanna talk about like the ZK future. So let's kick off with this, uh, I wanna say like high level deep dive into Endgame, the blog post that you recently wrote Vitalik. So sure. in it, you, you outlined multiple paths that would give us a trustless censorship resistant Ethereum, but it would be scaled. And the first sort of block was very much a roadmap. And to me, that was like a roadmap without rollups. There's four design possibilities, four design changes um, that would help. So do you want to ex just explain to us a little bit what that roadmap looks like? Sure. So that um, part of the post was basically actually trying to answer the question of, like, if you take a, block, a, a big block blockchain, so something even much bigger than Ethereum, right? Like one of these uh, chains that tries to, you know, like have very high TPS, have uh, not like, and uh, completely sacrifice decentralization and uh, have very few nodes, right? So going much further on that uh, dimension than uh, Ethereum was. Like how, if you start from there, how could you turn that into something that like say, like I would feel comfortable building an ecosystem around? Um, and <clears throat> basically, the like the challenge with uh, those blockchains as they are today, right? I think uh, I yeah, outlined uh, it a little bit when I yeah, wrote the post on uh, uh, sh I think uh, the limits to blockchain scalability of about half a year ago, right? Where I yeah, I kind of wrote that little short story of like you know what happens if like seventy percent of the validators actually do collude and they try to force through some change that everyone else said uh, and hates. And you know, if you don't have uh, fully validated nodes, then like they're going to be able to actually like force that change through, and users are not going to be able to do anything about it until it's too late. Um, so the idea that I have is basically that you just add in the like elements of uh, decentralized validation, right? And decentralized validation is something that we do know how to do. Um, so we have, like for example, we know how to. Um, you know, mark, put the state into a Merkle tree. We know how to like put state roots after like every small bundle of transactions. We know how to make a fraud proof. We know how to make it so that if the, if the block has even one mistake in it, then like you can make a fraud proof that covers just that one mistake. 
um, and then broadcast that fraud proof. And then the rest of the network, even if they don't have anywhere close to the computational capacity you need to actually run a full node, they would still be able to verify this fraud proof and they would know that, hey, you know, this, block, this sub blockchain is trying to push through something that breaks the rules. Right, so that was one change. Um, and then the alternative to fraud proofs was to instead use uh, zero knowledge proofs, or I get the TK snarks, and just like verify the correctness of uh, the block correctly. And then um, add also, if you want an extra layer of protection, you can add committees. Um, and if to, to verify the data is available, then um, you know, we can add in a data availability sampling, which is it, itself a, a big technological rabbit hole. But like the goal of it is to basically like have this kind of collaborative decentralized way of checking that the data of the block actually gets published, right? And so, mm. you know, if after publishing that block the nodes disappear, then like there's still the data floating around somewhere so that the rest of the network can uh, keep building on top of it. And if it does have fraud, so that the rest of the network can have fraud through it, right? So like, my argument is that if you start with the centralized uh, ch like chains of today, and you just kind of add this extra armor on top, then, you know, you could, end up with something that's pretty decent, right? Like, you know, you, you solve the fraud, you solve the data availability issues, you add like some extra channels for transactions to get in that have to be included so they can't censor. And like the result is something where block production is centralized, but like all of this kind of extra protocol armor that you're adding prevents them from actually like doing anything really terrible. And there in that first model, that roadmap, you also said, oh, I'm getting to, unstable message. If, just let me know if you can hear me. Okay. 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 You actually made a distinction between the block validation and the block production. Is this like, can you kind of go a little deeper, like without like block production as a, as a separate thing? Sure. Um, so I think uh, original Bitcoin philosophy, right? Basically like said, block production equals block validation, right? Because um, you know, to produce a block, you take a bunch of transactions, you run the process of like validating or executing or whatever those transactions, um, and then you make a block um, and you publish the block. And so then, in order for someone else to verify the block, like they have to run like basically the same code, right? They have to check the signatures in the same way that you check the signatures. They have to update the state in the same way that you updated updated the state. Um, they have to. Um, you know, check the hashes in the same way that you check the hashes. Like they basically repeat what you did, right? And so there's this kind of one-to-one -one correspondence. It's like every unit of effort that you use in producing a block is also a unit of effort that every other node on the network has to individually take um, in order to validate it. And this is one of these uh, like big bottlenecks to scalability, right? Um, so the, uh, now with um, some of these newer technologies, we can actually start to decouple uh, production from validation. Actually, even like if you don't take into account like fraud proofs and ZK Starks and any of the fancy stuff, um, one other technology that lets you do this is uh, stateless clients, right? So this is the idea that whoever builds the block, they have to hold the state. So they have to hold everyone's accounts, hold everyone's balances, hold everyone's public keys. And they um, then like, have, um, add Merkle proofs, right? So they add Merkle proofs, like these Merkle branches proving all of the individual accounts that were actually touched by the transaction. And then they just include those Merkle proofs as part of the transaction. And someone verifying uh, a block does not have to have the state, right? Like you do not need to have like more than, you know, like a few megabytes of RAM basically in order to verify one of these stateless blocks because uh, everything you need to verify the block is part of the block, right? And like the block just tell like the block just has this extra information telling you like hey you know Bob did have seventy five coins and Joe did have one hundred and fifteen coins and now Joe is going to have uh, ninety coins and uh, you know Bob's going to have hundred coins and here's the Merkle proofs that prove um, that like the the num the numbers are all correct and that they like match up with the root right and so if you do that then you're already like you're making this separation right you're basically saying well. If fear of uh, producing a block requires having a big hard drive, verifying a block does not require having a big hard drive because uh, you just verify the, these Merkle proofs instead, right? And then ZK snarks, they go way further, right? Just with a ZK snark, you're making production even more expensive to some extent because you're saying if you produce a block, 
then you also have to you know, do all of this extra polynomial magic with all of its overhead on top. Um, but then when, um, once you do that, and once you create and you add the proof, verifying the proof is really easy, right? So the amount of work needed to create the block goes up, but the amount of work needed to verify the block goes way, way down. Um, and so this already starts to like bring us closer to this world, right? Where um, you, know, you have these uh, more centralized block producers, but with these uh, like more decentralized forms of verification, you can prevent them from doing uh, like as much um, actually mean things because like if they try pushing an invalid block uh, through, then like guess what? They're not going to be able to make a valid proof. Hmm. I see yeah, in a um, disappeared, um, but I guess um, like just to kind of continue through my yeah, uh, my post uh, on my own a bit. Um, so like that that that's kind of the the principle that enables all of this, right? I think. I might even say like that's the principle that enables kind of blockchain scalability theory in general. Like I, to me, blockchain scalability theory is all about like removing this one-to-one -one correspondence, right, and making uh, the verification easier than uh, block production. Um, so then I start talking about rollups, right? And rollups are this really fascinating layer two scaling uh, strategy, um, where basically you like you do even more separation of. Uh, like basically block production and block verification, right? Um, because uh, what, what a rollup does is it says, well, so you have the Ethereum network and the Ethereum network has its layer one state. Like, you know, like, uh, like Alice can have 75 you know, ETH, Bob can have 100 ETH, and all of these, like, you know, the summer smart contract can have a piece of code. All of these things are just like kept track of by all the Ethereum nodes. And then with a the rollup, we say, well, we have this one smart contract. And like we can call it like this gateway contract. And that smart contract stores in its storage a Merkle root. And that Merkle root is, from the point of view of Ethereum, just a 32 byte hash, right? Like whatever, it's a 32 byte hash. If you're like Ethereum handles 32 byte hashes all the time. Um, but from the point of view of its own protocol, it's the Merkle root of this whole other universe that Ethereum is not even aware of. And inside of this universe, um, you know, like you can have lots of people doing their own things, like people can have. Uh, different coins, you can have even more smart contracts. And the theory is basically that to update this Merkle root, you don't actually have to like directly tell Ethereum what every single one of the transactions are. You just provide a proof, right? Because um, if you provide a proof, um, then like you are doing the proving off chain and you're providing a little bit of data. And uh, like that little bit of data goes, um, on, uh, goes on chain. And that's just like a highly compressed record that just says, um, you know, Alice plus 25, Bob minus. It would sound like it looks like you just uh, muted. You got me. You accidentally, accidentally muted yourself. So, but so like, I, I got a question for you if you want to, uh, it, since we're waiting for Anna to come back, I have a question. Um, I saw a couple of excellent tweets the other day talking about this kind of end state and one of them that i thought was particularly thoughtful was uh in this future uh, is ethereum really for blockchain and end users are going to migrate to the layer twos mm -hmm. and and the future of ethereum is blockchain to blockchain connectivity and our multi-chain future mm -hmm. is actually um you know it's all the ethereum ecosystem wondering your sort of thoughts right. about sort of what is the future of the end user in that ecosystem right. that's exactly where i what i'm um, what i'm getting at right um because uh, what, what you have with these rollups is right, you have these like extra universes that get created where like if the Ethereum protocol by itself is not aware of them. All it does is just verify a few proofs. Um, but then the rollups, like they do have all these universes and doing things inside of these uh, rollup universes is much, much cheaper than doing them on Ethereum because of how it doesn't, like the entire Ethereum what, um, ecosystem doesn't have to verify all these transactions. Just the, just the people in those rollups have to verify those transactions. And so what that basically means is that you, you have much lower scalability, or so you have much higher scalability. Um, and you also have like much more creativity for people to do different things, right? Like you can have a rollup that runs Blossom. You can have a rollup that runs a Bitcoin like UTXO model. You can have a rollup that runs like a version of the PVM but parallelized. Um, and uh, you know, you can get, a lot of these really cool benefits of um, they having a yeah, multi-chain ecosystem, um, except with uh, 
Ethereum acting as this common base layer that basically provides what we call shared security, right? So like instead of, uh, you know, having like a hundred blockchains, those hundred blockchains all talk to each other. And then if you have lots of these very interconnected applications, if even one of those blockchains get 51% attacks then that might like risk the entire network, you just say, well, no, all hundred, uh, all of these hundred things are rollups. They all like live on Ethereum. And, uh, you know, when they, um, and they all derive security from, you know, the Ethereum base layer, the Ethereum data availability layer, um, and all of these things. And so in order to make any single one of them break, you basically have to make Ethereum break, right? And like, so this kind of like shared root of trust and shared root of bridging, like it allows for cross roll of communication to be really efficient. It allows for shared security. You have all these, um, all these nice properties, but at the same time, right? What this means is that like the long-term future of Ethereum, you know, either one roll up wins, um, in which case that one rollup has to learn how to be really scalable. And we actually end up in a world that looks really similar to the world where you start with a not scalable base layer, or sorry, you start with a scalable but centralized base layer, and then you add this uh, kind of trust armor, where instead here, like you start off with Ethereum, which is just a trust armor, and then you like add this extra rollup thing that provides the scalability, right? So if one rollup wins, then we're in that world. And then if many rollups win, then you know, we're in the kind of in interchain world, but with uh, shared security. So I thought that's like really interesting, right? If you're like, there's a lot of different paths to doing things in the blockchain land, but a lot of them actually end up leading to very similar places. Very cool. Um, I'm back. I, I apologize. I dropped off at some point, but thank you so much for continuing there. And actually, this is a great point to open the conversation up a little bit. Um, on this topic of multi-chain, I mean, here we have with us a number of teams that are going to be building very different types of rollups. Um, but first, before we do that, I wanted to actually ask Mihail Mihailo, um, Polygon has invested in ZK. And I, I'm very curious, like a lot of the teams have presented very rollup focused concepts. Do you feel like it's primarily driven by the scaling need right now? Or do you think that there could actually be new possibilities that are opened up by this? You mean by the by the zk rollups in general like these are it's basically but... yeah it's like investing into zk for scaling do you think that's purely for scaling or do you think it opens up new possibilities definitely, definitely. yeah that's a yeah. fantastic question yeah thanks so much and uh, we believe uh, uh, zk zk based solutions have, have much wider basically uh, area of application than, than scaling specifically it's only that scaling is now still a pressing need in the ethereum ecosystem so we have started like basically Vitalik has started something amazing and uh, like millions of people want to join this this uh, new paradigm, this new idea of global internet of value and web free. And we really have this pressing need to, to uh, um, welcome these people and allow them to experiment with the, uh, uh, with the Ethereum basically. So once ideally I foresee maybe in one to two years, we will, we will have some, uh, uh, some solutions in place that will be scalable, much more scalable than those that we have today and that will have security properties of Ethereum and that pressing need to scale will be kind of relieved, kind of relieved. Then I believe we will see other interesting and amazing applications of ZK technology, primarily on the side of privacy uh, related to identity, for example, and many, many really other, uh, other inter interesting applications. That is at least my opinion or uh, my bet for the future. Very cool. Um, I want to ask a question to Jordi and Brendan, actually. So the two of you have proposed uniquely the ZK EVMs, and I've been very curious about kind of how those are similar or different. Like, I know you're working together in a lot of ways, but could we explore that a little bit? What a Z, like a ZK EVM, maybe, maybe also just define what that actually means and how those two solutions are potentially a little different. I yeah, can, go ahead, Jordi. I, yeah, I can start. It's um, yeah, there, there are. I think there are two projects that they are started in different point and probably with different goals and with different environments. And we were independent. None of us were at quite for Polygon when we started the project, and and we have we come from different places. And uh, well, uh, I think we have uh, good things and things that maybe other teams are better and they have good things and maybe things that we can uh, go better. And 
the 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 good thing of of being in this case together in the same umbrella of, of polygon is that uh, we have this collaboration relationship and mm. right now i understand much better what they are doing uh, and they probably understand much better what we are doing and uh, we can collaborate one and, and help on each other actually i would like this to be even opener not just to the polygon projects just to, mm -hmm. to wider projects and 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 because we are solving it's a humanity challenge you know it's not uh it's something that we need to solve if we want to blockchains to, to to scale we need to somehow work together and totally. and, uh, and and for us you know these are uh, there is nobody that holds like the other knowledge for building this and and as much uh, knowledge we can join together in order to scale this, we will do it faster and better. And, and this is a little bit the spirit. Of course, collaborating uh, teams is, is, is not easy, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, it just we are just starting. You know, it's just uh, it's just the beginning. But uh, the 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 feeling is that we are sharing the same goals. We come from different places. We have different knowledge, but we are sharing the same goals and. Uh, I'm sure that we will uh, work every time closer and, 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 and better. Nice. Now, Brandon, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, I think, Jordi, you just shared sort of the similarities. I mean, the, the use of Fry or the use of Fry-like techniques in both are a similarity there that I noticed from the presentation that Brandon did earlier. Um, but Brandon, yeah, maybe do you want to share a little bit about the way you're thinking about it? Uh, yeah, sure. I, I think just to echo what Jordi said, um, it's been really great working with Hermes and, and with Maiden. And um, I feel like we've sort of created the foundation for uh, something really special moving forward. Um, I think that, that the way that we see it, um, I think I, I don't want to speak for, for Jordi, but I think what they're working on is, is super cool, like um, sort of simulating uh, the EVM kind of opcode for opcode or, or close to that. Um, in a snark is like an amazing goal. Um, for us, like our ambitions might be a little bit more modest. Um, I, our goal is we, we'd like to be able to take existing Solidity code and mm -hmm. transpile it um, into what we call ZK bytecode, um, maybe swapping out some things that are really expensive uh, in a snark like SHA-3 for uh, more arith arithmetic friendly um, hash functions. Um, and yeah, just, just trying to to, to build something that's that's very performant and um, and can scale. Um, so that's cool. that's how I'd sort of characterize um, both. Like it, it's just great to be able to to work within Polygon and to kind of explore uh, the whole design space and collaborate. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. I actually want to I want to bring in Bob in a little bit on the conversation now because. I mean, that use, you talk about the collaboration and then you're using Fry, which te like originally came from Starks. Mm -hmm. Bobbin, you're building a Stark-based rollup. Do you want to tell us a little bit about, I don't know, maybe we can talk a little bit about the connection or what you're getting from some of this dialogue. Oh, you're muted, by the way. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, so I think in terms of collaboration, there is a lot of like, I think uh, there are some similarities with both projects that uh, kind of we think about uh, uh, in many different technical areas. One example that I kind of talked about in, the, uh, in my presentation is that uh, because, for example, uh, um, Starks are very flexible and, you know, Fry allows you to be flexible in terms of choosing the finite field you're in. Uh, Maiden is actually using the same finite field as uh, Polygon Zero uh, is using. So we have abilities to mm. uh, kind of like uh, jointly work on different things that might be useful in that specific field and uh, use, uh, you know, it will be used in both projects. And that's in terms of optimizations and in terms of like developing arithmetizations for specific problems that, uh, you know, uh, either they come up with and I can use or I come up with and they can use. And, you know, uh, that works uh, very well. And, uh, you know, there are other decision points, like in terms of like, how do you, like I, overall, I think there are three big buckets of choices when you kind of think about the solutions. And the first bucket is, uh, you know, what proving system you use and what arithmetization you use. And then the other bucket is uh, kind of, what is the design of your virtual machine? For example, are you gonna, uh, you know, which field are you gonna choose? What is gonna be your instruction set? Is it gonna be uh, very close to the EVM or as close as possible? Or is it gonna be slightly mm -hmm. different and then you're gonna transpile? 
And the third uh, design choice that you need to make is what your network architecture is going to look like. And uh, you know, there are different, uh, like, uh, you know, with Hermes, we might look more into like their network architecture, architecture of how they're thinking about and try to uh, uh, have like some, uh, some of the learnings from there to apply to Maiden. But uh, in the proving system uh, aspect, we might be more close to what Polygon Zero is doing. And so we might take some learnings from there. So there is a lot of different areas to kind of collaborate and uh, cross-pollinate knowledge across. <laughs> I feel like your conversations are probably incredibly interesting. I hope you document some of this for others because like just thinking, and, and actually, yeah, what are the plans for how to share information within the org and also outside of it? I think one of the things I want to say, the conversations that we have is like probably a highlight of my week. Like I have to wake yeah. up a little bit earlier than I usually would like to, but uh, it is a highlight of my week when uh, we could just basically chat for a few hours about like the things that we've done over the last week and what we are planning to do and like what problems everybody's facing and like what solutions uh, we have found. So it's, it's really cool. I can only second what what, uh, what Bobin said, and it's like really, really we, one of the things. Of course, we are really proud that we have uh, all these amazing people and these amazing projects now under the Polygon umbrella. But what we are really, really proud of, uh, and what is really exciting, is to see actually these teams working together. It's like very clear spirit of collaboration. Not even a mentioning or or even thought about you know one team being competitor to to each other or something like that. And we really are aware that this is like early stage of innovation and, and mm -hmm. it's like really, really amazing and inspiring to to watch these teams basically uh, on these calls uh, discussing exchanging knowledge updating each other it's, it's like really amazing and exactly as Jordi said we would really like to be we don't want to be a closed source you know zk mm -hmm. powerhouse like or something that is not shared with the public we want to inc include all other relevant projects, individu individuals, we are still discussing and thinking about ways how we can make this more open to the, to the general uh, community and to everyone basically that are interested in, in uh, scaling Ethereum in this way. Cool. Well, I like to hear that. Paul, I want to ask you about your solution. Um, so when I heard about Nightfall, it's like this idea of mixing uh, optimistic rollups with ZK rollups yeah, tell me a little bit about when that kind of came to fruition. What was the, like, why did you decide to actually add the optimistic to this? So, I mean, we've been working on privacy for what, five, six years now. We actually showed the first version of, of Nightfall in 2018 at DevCon in Prague. And mm -hmm. we've been, we've been cranking out that we cut the gas fees. We implemented, you know, simplified all, all of the, the data sources. We, we ended up with uh, batching. And you're just in an endless race with how you uh, kind of drive down the gas fees and the cost structure to make it affordable. So, you know, there's, if you talk to enterprises, there's a couple of things that they really care about. Number one, right, they, they really want to have privacy. Like, you know, enterprises will not do anything. If I'm going to move my inventory or buy stuff from another company, that's sensitive in business information. How many widgets I'm buying, who I'm selling them to, how much I'm paying for them. That is incredibly sensitive. They will not do anything without privacy. That's like job one. Mm -hmm. And then the other issue is, and, and this comes up all the time with enterprises and, you know, I, um, is they're like, I, I'm worried about the gas fees. Are the gas fees going to be unreliable? Is it going to be too high? Right. They, they understand that they want some predictability in their cost structure. So uh, back in the beginning of this year, we were looking at sort of where to go next. And we realized like optimistic rollups give us this excellent combination of, um, kind of speed, uh, cost, and privacy. And so Nightfall 3 became an optimistic roll-up. And then we're working with Polygon, we're able to turn it into Polygon Nightfall and add things like instant withdrawal that we showed earlier today. Very cool. And that focus on privacy, I actually kind of like, we mentioned this sort of like maybe with the scaling comes privacy, but to the other three teams here, Bob and Jordy and Brandon, is that very, like how close on the roadmap is privacy for each of you? Like, is that built in or is that kind of coming later? I can try I, to take this. Oh, go ahead. Okay. I was just going to say very quickly, like we are, you know, the, the, the level of cooperation that you were talking about inside of Polygon across those teams, that has also been applied to the relationship with EY and the level of cooperation is astonishing. I mean, so many brilliant people like Brendan and Bobbin and, and there's a, you know, Mahilo is, is coordinating a lot of that. So I will say, we are we're we're not going to silo the privacy knowledge in one place. 
I wouldn't imagine that. It sounds like that would be very off brand. <laughs> cool. Okay, Bobin, yeah, you were about to say yeah, something about that. I, I do want to say that, like, even though the scaling is the primary goal, and uh, but I do think, like, for me personally, privacy is also uh, almost as important as scaling, although we need to prioritize uh, uh, scaling right now. But I do think, like, when I think about, uh, like, the design of the virtual machine is, like, uh, like how can we support privacy or design of the network itself, uh, the roll up, how can we support privacy in the future? And I do make sometimes uh, very conscious design choices, which uh, may not be necessarily ideal for uh, supporting scaling, although it's not gonna hurt it too much, but they will make uh, uh, supporting privacy or privacy preserving smart contracts much easier in the future. So it is very much front and center for me. Cool. Jordi, yeah. Brandon? Oh, yeah, it's part, of course, it's, it's part of the roadmap. Of course, it's not like the first priority that we have right now. As as, as Bobin says, I think we need to solve right now. The first is to scale, but mm -hmm. uh, immediately next is uh, immediately next is privacy. And, and this is, of course, uh, important. And uh, yeah, maybe Brandon can add some value here, but I think that the, the recursive recursive snarks is a key piece for for privacy uh, at some point. So maybe Brandon, you can add some some points there. Yeah, I think just like you said, I I think for us one of the obviously we've been focused on scaling, but one of the benefits of having um, really uh, fast provers is and and sort of focusing on uh, commodity hardware for provers is that. Um, for applications that require proofs to be generated on the client side, um, we can do that like very, very quickly. Um, and so our prover performance sort of makes transaction creation feel like instantaneous for a private transaction. Whereas before, um, if you were creating uh, a proof for a more complicated or like general smart contract, um, it could take like 30 or 40 seconds um, with previous primitives. And so that, that's something that, that we're excited about. But um, like Bobbin and, and Jordy said, we're sort of focused on scaling for, for the short term. Cool. And Paul, I have one last question on your project, which is like, I, I know the project ZK Opru, which is also a ZK rollup, op, optimistic rollup combined. How do you see yourselves as different from that or similar? So we looked across, when we started out some of our work and thinking about optimistic rollups, we looked across all the layer twos, right? There mm -hmm. of which we, we sort of counted up 12 right? Four of them are focused on privacy. Um, Zikapru is in, in next to ours in terms of snark usage, one of the most efficient. I think where we see kind of a really important difference beyond the, the, the integration and the work with Polygon is our license is a Creative Commons public domain license. And there's a very conscious choice behind that. There's mm -hmm. no GPL, there's no anything, right? So there's no complications, there's no friction, you don't have to sit there and go through the license terms and think, is there a gotcha or a surprise here? It is a pure unrestricted contribution to the Ethereum ecosystem. And, and there are, there's no surprises. There's no monetization model in there. Um, uh, I realize I'm not going to make myself CEO of the year with this speech, but uh, it really, you know, we wanted to drive adoption and make a contribution to the community. And, and this is where we kind of made our stand. And in, in mm -hmm. working with Polygon, we found people who were like, yeah, that's a good idea. And, and that made a big difference. That actually, like the next topic I want to touch on are the tools that are missing. And I feel like this kind of open source ethos, like let's think of it in that context. So very, very usable, very open source. What, what are the tools that maybe the Polygon teams or Polygon affiliated teams or maybe outside teams should be thinking about building in the ZK space? I know that's pretty general, but I'd love to hear from all of you what you're thinking about this. Sure. Uh, yeah, thanks, Anna, for the question. And um, I think, of course, the question is very important. And there's like several uh, ways or several things that we're doing in, in, in that regard. So first of all, with, uh, all the teams are pursuing this Ethereum compatibility in one way or another, either we're implementing the EVM itself or introducing compilers that will uh, support uh, uh, Solidity, etc. And that is already a we're doing a huge service to ourselves, first of all, like we're benefiting from everything that has been created in the Ethereum ecosystem. So all the toolings from wallets to block explorers to all, all those very important toolings. And we are very much aware building Polygon and Polygon POS chain example and Plasma before that we are very aware of this big difference. Once you build a solution that is not Ethereum compatible or EVM compatible, like we did with Plasma initially. And once you have an EVM compatible solution, it's like a huge difference. So you instantly are a 
in a much, much better position because you just simply can inherit, I mean, simply, uh, relatively easily, you can inherit all the existing toolings of Ethereum. That's number one. Number two, we are uh, fortunate that we have now multiple uh, ZK based effort or ZK rollup specifically within the Polygon ecosystem. And we are already starting uh, an internal effort uh, to, to kind of uh, uh, introduce some standards because there are a lot of components and tools that will be shared between these solutions. So mm -hmm. the core, I guess, engines and or virtual machines of these solutions are quite different, I would say. But uh, the other components are, are relatively similar and there's a lot of overlap there. And uh, moreover, there's overlap with the existing POS chain. There's overlap with the, the stack of our Polygon SDK, a solution, another solution that we have. And we are currently establishing these standards and we believe this will significantly uh, speed up the development and make the solution at the same, all the solutions at the same time uh, uh, more bulletproof in a sense that all of them will use the components so there will be the same components so they will be uh, uh, much more battle tested and, and uh, I guess secure. Uh, the third thing that we intend to do is that we, as, as, I, as I said uh, earlier on the panel, we have this one billion which is pretty significant commitment to develop these types of solutions. We will be offering uh, extensively grants and uh, publishing constantly uh, missing components or tools that uh, are required for the ecosystem in general, not only for mm -hmm. Polygon, of course. And these are at least three things that immediately come to mind when it comes to uh, um, building or introducing all the, the missing components, I guess. So yeah, I'll leave it to others. Yeah. That question of which tools, this has actually come up recently. We're doing a Gitcoin side round, just FYI, all focused on ZK tech. And one of the thoughts that we had around that was like, how, how, like, what, what does the community actually need in terms of ZK and how is that communicated outward? Like, I'd love to find ways maybe together with the Polygon team to like gather some of those tools and share them to the larger community so that like we can find those teams to potentially build them. I kind of want to throw to Vitalik again about this, like from your perspective, maybe, maybe it's not exactly tools, but what pieces do you feel need to be implemented for some of those futures you outlined earlier in this? What kinds of uh, tools needs to be yeah, implemented? Let's see, I think, um, I did, like, first of all, the, uh, the, the Ethereum layer one um, needs to be yeah, improved, obviously. Like, you know, we need to actually yeah, um, finish up with the proof of stake. Um, we need to execute on the yeah, sharding roadmap and, um, you know, like actually add more data space um, so that rollups have uh, some place where they can put data on. Um, mm -hmm. I, like, about a yeah, week ago, I yeah, released to this uh, post, um, it was the, the data sharding roadmap where I yeah, talked about how to like split it up into different stages where like just adding more, like reducing the gas cost of call data would be the first step. And then you would add like a shard or like a, a couple of shards to just add a bit of data space and everyone would still download it. But like you would at least get the uh, sharding machinery um, in place and uh, kind of test it a bit. And then that just gets expanded over time. And then we add data availability sampling over time. So the whole thing stays uh, like client friendly. And uh, eventually we'll just have this like, you know, several megabytes a second worth of uh, data space that rollups could just uh, freely use. And uh, that, uh, that by itself is already enough to just give up you know, a huge amount of scalability for um, rollups. But in order to get there, that stuff has to actually be built, right? Yeah. So that's one piece. Um, and I think, uh, you know, ZK EVM implementations, I mean, we've talked about them a lot, but also just like very important in the very yeah, general purpose uh, infrastructure. Um, I think, uh, one other thing also that I think doesn't get talked about with the uh, ZKVM implementations is that they have two purposes. One of them is that they enable fully EVM compatible ZK rollups. And the other is that they enable better light clients of the Ethereum chain, right? Because mm -hmm. um, you know, the Ethereum, for the Ethereum chain itself, like, you know, we would love to start it. We would love to make it so that you don't need like as much of a heavy node in order to be able to process and like verify things that are on the Ethereum chain. Um, so, if uh, you know that itself gets us snarks, then that, that's uh, also something that's uh, going to be amazing. Um, sure. No, no, go ahead. Fin uh, I, I, um, number, I have... Sorry, um, number three: um, cross rollup uh, bridging infrastructure. Um, just um, you know, if we're going to have a, like a layer two world in general, like that's uh, 
you know, can't be avoided. Um, like I've written some posts on like how I think some cross parallel bridging can be done in a fully decentralized way. I know there's a whole bunch of projects that are working on like a, a bunch of different uh, versions of uh, ways to do that. Um, so really excited to see that space mature more. Um, Very cool. And then yeah, that experience stuff. Yeah. Okay. Fine. I'm done. That. Oh no! Wait, no, keep going. If you have another one, I really, I really am done. Um, okay. Well, you just mentioned actually bridging, and I want to understand, like, as as we imagine more and more rollups coming out, all having these different forms. Mihal, Mihalo, you talked about standards, but what is like are and maybe it's too early at this point, but like, are you all thinking about the bridges between your different potential rollups, and and is this something that you already see on the horizon? Is this a problem you're going to get to later? I'm just curious what the thinking is around that. Yeah, great question. And I just might use the word standard. The word standards is we're being very cautious with that word at Polygon okay. at this point. Like we don't want to impose any sort of um, constraints. We believe this is a phase really of, of uh, um, high intensity innovation and experimentation within the Ethereum community in general, including Polygon, of course. And Hence, why we do not want to impose any final, you know, um, global architecture or ways or standards how these uh, applications or projects will communicate among themselves. Uh, we really want to we want things to happen organically. We see a lot of collaboration between these teams, and let's see what happens organically. So, might we might see some of these solutions converge into one? Maybe mm -hmm. they will not continue to exist separately. Again, what is really important for us is that. They are all working together towards the same basically goal. So we are being really careful not to impose any standard standards. When I said standards, I meant like helpful, basically uh, reuse, reusing components in a helpful way. Um, yeah. But that being said, moving forward in the future, like Vitalik, as, as he mentioned, he had a very interesting idea uh, how to, to bridge these rollups in a trustless manner and we are willing to explore we just want to explore and facilitate as much innovation as possible we believe polygon is a very good position uh, um, now in terms of resources reach network effects and everything and all of that was or pretty much all was enabled by by ethereum basically so we owe ethereum community and ethereum uh, 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 layer one a lot so i think this is now the perfect time for us to to start giving back actually Cool. I want to kind of imagine, like, I think, I think we're at the stage where we can start sort of also like predicting or not predicting, imagining the future of ZK, what, what could be coming down the line? So, you know, we've talked about this, pri the private rollups often in the case, often it's like private transaction within the rollup, but when you start offering something like private computation, I'm kind of curious, like, what does a theory, what did, what a things living in a non-private and a private actually, like how would they, is there any envisionment on how these would interact? And I don't know, Vitalik, if you're thinking about like what a privacy, it's, it's a roll up. In Cosmos, you call it a privacy zone, but like what kind of thing, what, what does a, a fully private roll up with potentially private computation actually mean? Mm. Yeah, I think uh, privacy preserving um, smart contracts like infrastructure is uh, it's a really big and <laughs> um, it's, it's a really big and exciting field um, all on its own. Um, I think uh, like one thing is that there is no magic bullet, right? I think uh, and like there is no magic like and that's more true for privacy than it is for scaling, right? Because like for scaling, you can't say that there is a magic bullet. You just like try really hard and have a bunch of amazing and really smart people make CKVM implementations, and then you just copy what you have, right? But with privacy, the problem is, like the is um, that um, you have to start thinking like much more explicitly about well, like who actually gets to have each piece of data. Right, because in order to make an update with a piece of data, you need to have a piece of data. And so you can't have uh, you know, like literal black boxes where nobody like, sees anything. Um, and uh, you know, you have to have data that data has encryption keys, and there's some people see each of these uh, each of these encryption keys. Um, and so like you have to think explicitly about like who are the owners of things in a privacy preserving system that you don't have to think about in just like an, um, an EVM system. And so, like you, you are going to have to like work hard on programming languages in a way that you don't 
if all you're doing is just copying Solidity. Um, you uh, have to like actually think hard about like what applications are possible. Do applications even need to be redesigned? Like is privacy preserving Uniswap something that's even possible? Right? Like who would even have the encryption keys to the EMF? Or you know, do you have to design it in a totally different way? Um, so you know, it's this big field, um, I, and I think uh, it is going to take uh, quite a bit of learning. Um, yeah. I uh, yeah, I expect um, you know we're going to start with the simple stuff. Like you know, just being able to move coins around, and then people are going to build more and more, and we'll see what happens. That idea of the private AMMs, I and mean, this is a topic I've covered a couple times on the show. I wonder if the roll-up builders are the roll-up builders working closely with the AMM builders on that front. Like, is that is there a strong connection between those two communities? Paul, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. So I, I don't know if there's a strong connection, but I, I do want to, there's, there is something very, there's a couple of very specific things that we are working on that I think are, are, are relevant and, and you could make a private AMM. One is okay. uh, we're building something called Starlight. And the idea behind Starlight is, you know, what you can do is you can mark up the logic in a Solidity smart contract. And we're, we're doing this now in cooperation with Polygon, you can mark up the logic in the Solidity smart contract and uh, it will compile it into a zero knowledge circuit. Now, right now, we can take a standard ERC-20 contract, we put it into Starlight, and what we get out is the original version of Nightfall, basically, right? So we can do it for a simple ERC-20. What we want to be able to do is to basically throw any arbitrary business logic on it and then generate a, a zero-knowledge circuit coming out of that so you can have logic that runs on chain. And the, the reason you want logic to run on chain with privacy and not just do it off-chain and post the proof is a lot of business processes between companies, there are multiple participants, right? Uh, if you have a network level business problem, you can't have an individual participant successfully solve that for all the other network participants behind their firewall in their ERP system. Right now they can see too much confidential information from all the others. So uh, this is something that's, that's super important. And then the other thing is um, we're, we're working on something called Midnight. The goal is to make all the transactions look the same. Right now you can still look at, oh, he made a deposit, she made a withdrawal. We wanna uh, basically um, uh, uh, really make things are even darker and make it harder to do network traffic analysis on who's doing business with whom. Got it, cool. Jordi, I, I have a quick question for you. I don't know if, it, like, are you, have you spoken with a, any of the AMM builders, any of the DeFi? folks i'm just so curious if there's like if there I mean, isn't yet of like a crew doing that we should start bringing you together <laughs> I, I, i've been talking with some of them but not uh, in the roll-up context i've been talking I just see, for uh, you know auditing out. smart contracts and you know uh, formal verifications and other stuff that are very interesting and they are managing but not in the not in the not not yet no it's not but at the end they are a smart contract so uh, of course if you go to privacy uh, amen this is like another story but at the end uh actually it's like an example of a smart contract that can be run in a zkdm and 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 from this point of view it's not the only smart contract because we are planning to run any smart contract on there but of course is uh if it's not the first it's the second smart contract kind that you are looking at and, yeah. and and yeah that's 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 important a lot of the traffic uh, right now in ethereum is happening in, in in those smart contracts so far i know we're, we don't have too much time left but i want to ask a few more things so like so far we've talked really about zero knowledge for scaling zero knowledge for privacy but I know that there's some like moonshot use cases for ZK and this is maybe not on exactly what you're working on, but I want it since I have like six ZK experts here, why don't we, if you're up for it, just sort of share some ideas or some things you've heard in the ZK space that could be really, really exciting coming down the line that maybe even go past those two use cases. And this is to anyone. And I hope there are some ideas. I think um, like, a lot, like they, they do end up having to do with uh, scalability and privacy, but there are applications that take advantage of the privacy in very different ways. Mm -hmm. um, so voting might be one example, right? Like a lot of the voting in these uh, existing DAOs just ends up happening completely in the clear. Um, and like uh, I've written many times about like why yeah, that style like, ends up leading to bribes and ends up leading to uh, just 
all kinds of collusion and there's some kind of like fairly nasty things and uh, you know like having more secret ballot elections is something that could really improve uh, DAO governance um, so that like that and uh, you know the work that's happening with Macy and like all of those uh, uh, projects I think is uh, something really interesting um, another one is um, zero knowledge proofs for like anti DOS or like anti spam purposes um, so the idea that, of that like you can prove that you have some token um, and uh, without actually proving like which particular uh, what one of those uh, people you are um, but, like I think that's something that can be used to like protect decentralized messengers um, like status like for example against the uh, DOS attacks um, it's a uh, if the token that you're zero knowledge proving is uh, a proof of humanity token, then um, you know you can have like things like UBIs and like things like a, you know like civil resistance in a way that's friendly to people who don't have lots of money um, without like having to actually you know create on chain mapping between like transactions and people's literal faces. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's uh, you know something that could be huge. Um, yeah, I know and I, what you just made me think of is an example that comes more from the financial, which is like whitelisting using ZKPs, but actually that idea could be used also just for like accessing groups or like knowing that certain tokens are in somewhere without knowing anything more about that, that account um, or that user. Like it's, it's very, I mean, there's some really cool Id like identity groups, group management, like, yeah, I don't know. This is an exciting space. So, so what about, so, oh, go said, ahead. Just, yeah, as Vitalik said, I think more or less all of these uh, use cases go back to either scaling or privacy in one way or another, basically. But there's like really so many uh, interesting or really necessary applications. Like one recent example was this constitution DAO where people amazingly, you know, pulled together a capital and almost bought the, the, the US constitution. And it's just one yeah. example where you really need privacy because if that uh, pooling of capital was private, then the opposing side or other bidders wouldn't be able to know how much constitution DAO is actually willing to bid and they won't be able, they wouldn't be able to kind of uh, somewhat trivially outbid them because mm. you just simply know the, the, the amount of capital that the bidder has at disposal. So it's just one, one out of hundreds of very interesting applications of um, ZKPs when it comes to scaling and uh, privacy. Right, Pri private one. voting is really important. And then the other one I, I, it, I think it's gonna be super important is, is proof of regulatory compliance without having to disclose all of your personal private information, right? And I, I think that this is gonna be a super interesting one for regulators, what's gonna happen the first time a company submits a mathematical proof instead of uh, all the documentation? I, I, I wanna be in the room for that. <laughs> yeah, there's gonna be a little bit of educating to get there on more on the regulatory side, but um, what about games? I mean, ZK games, there's one obviously like great example with Dark Forest, but I've also recently seen a lot more folks kind of come up with game ideas. And yeah, I'm wondering if you've seen anything in that direction as well that might be exciting. Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> we can just leave that there. Games and ZK, it's a thing. Check it out. I don't know. Um, I haven't I, seen anything, but I think once uh, ZK, like building ZKP um, focused applications and like, uh, you know, if it's easier to do with virtual machines or with compilers or whatever, once it becomes very accessible, there is going to be a lot of use cases within gaming where you want to, you know, prove uh, something to the other person, you know, uh, whether it is for exchange purposes as it is already happening using blockchains, but maybe even outside of blockchains, there could be very interesting use cases uh, for using ZKPs. But I think we do need to get mm -hmm. to a point where a regular developer can just pick up and start programming something that has uh, a ZKP uh, functionality built in. <laughs> Very cool. In general, actually, do you see like the Polygon ZK fund, this pool, like this is meant, I'm assuming for a lot of tools, like scaling solutions, libraries, but do you think that those like applications that live on top, but like really, really deeply use ZK would also potentially fall under that category? 
Absolutely, absolutely. Also funding uh, important research activities and everything that is directly or indirectly related to, to building or adoption of ZK-based uh, uh, scaling solutions and uh, privacy-focused solutions, everything falls under the, the scope, I guess, of, of this fund. This Definitely. Very and cool. that's why, like for us, it was really a huge commitment. Like, as I said, maybe, uh, as I said in the, in the beginning of the, the um, uh, event, uh, we are fortunate enough that our treasury is very strong now, but the, even like for us, this was a huge, huge commitment from our side. And it just uh, basically maybe manifests our, our um, belief how important this technology uh, really is for, for the whole ecosystem, for the whole industry. And that's why we decided to commit this significant amount and really help again everything that is indirectly or directly related to either research development or adoption of uh, this technology that's awesome and i want to mention like just uh, to piggyback on michael what said is that there are actually we're trying to do a, few, a couple of like fundamental research type of uh, things where we try to uh, you know figure out and you know engage researchers even outside of polygon to figure out how we can for example speed up Artization friendly hash functions even more once we have like specific constraints of you know we're going to use this field can we do something much more uh, uh, kind of performant in that specific field rather than trying to build a arithmetization friendly hash function in general so mm -hmm. uh, there are um, a couple of projects that we're trying to do just even in the foundational research type of uh, area fantastic i think we may be at time um kartik yeah are we are if, we if there's any uh, closing questions we can we can go with that but uh we're, we're at time. Okay. Well, yeah, if there's any, like anything that anyone here wants to mention before we sign off. Anyone? From my side, CK I is exciting. Explain. Join us Join. maybe. <laughs> yes, the literate one on that I previously said that I'm really personally as a co-founder of Polygon, I'm incredibly really humbled and proud and uh, grateful that we have all these great people now under the, the Polygon umbrella and the uh, such a huge support from the Ethereum community, including Vitalik. This is like very huge honor and again, a responsibility, but we are like fully committed and uh, again, grateful for all the support. And we are really just starting. Expect uh, a lot of great things from our very side. Very nice. Cool. All right. Well, I guess that wraps us up then. Good luck, <laughs> everyone. And we can't wait to see what happens in the Polygon, in the Polygon ZK world. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks, Anna. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. And uh, thank you so much, Anna, for moderating. And uh, I think uh, we are ready for a close. And one thing I just want to say is I want to just thank everybody for tuning in and watching this whole thing because what we're talking about, what we're doing now is what's going to be the standard a few years from now. And that, to me, is the most exciting piece. Like, you're, you're seeing a sneak peek at what the future looks like uh, in, in different pieces and just kind of, it's, it's just uh, the same quote around the features are already here, just not evenly distributed. And uh, we're just seeing a glimpse of what, what's to come. So thanks everybody for sharing everything that's, that's happening in this entire ecosystem. It's not even just Polygon, but all together, Ethereum and Zero Knowledge and Snarks and Starks. And uh, can't wait to see what comes out of all this that benefits Thank everybody. You. Sorry, and huge thanks to you, Kartik, and, and uh, your whole team for facilitating this. Thank you so much. We're, we're incredibly helpful. We're, we were honored to, uh, to have had the opportunity. So thank you so much. And uh, with that, um, congrats on everybody who uh, stayed till the end and uh, tuned in to see what's happening in this entire ecosystem. This wraps up uh, ZK Day for, uh, for us. And uh, for uh, those of you who are wondering, and I know that I'm going to get this question the most uh, in the next minute, we will be sending the POAP tokens to everybody via email directly. So don't worry, you'll get that email directly into your inbox if you signed in. And uh, stay tuned for uh, more things to come uh, from the global side. We'll be very soon sharing what 2022 looks like for all of us. Um, and uh, hope all of you enjoy the weekend and see you all in the next year. Take care, everybody. Thank <laughs> you.